All right. <clears throat> so how's everyone doing tonight? Let's see. It's about uh, three minutes after the hour. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. A uh, quick reminder, as always, check your chat settings. Um, it should say either to hosts and panelists or it should say to everyone. Uh, if it says panelists only or host only, then unfortunately only all be able to see your chat message. So definitely make sure uh, fix those chat settings now if they're not already correct. Uh, that way you can be a part of tonight's discussion. <clears throat> all right, so tonight is webinar number two as part of our book launch party for our new uh, AIT only practice exam. I'm sure a lot of you were probably here last week as well. Uh, today, we've got four brand new problems we're going to be solving. Uh, last week, of course, we solved three. Uh, this week, I think we can squeeze in uh, one more and still make it right in uh, Make it right in at the hour. Let's see, Mia asked, did you record webinar number one? Yep, sure did. Uh, so webinar number one is available right now on our YouTube channel. Um, we are recording this one. Uh, and this will also be posted as well on our YouTube channel. So again, don't feel uh, don't feel like you got to scramble to write everything down or copy everything down. Uh, you will be able to watch a recording of this uh, later on at your own time. All right. So agenda, just like last week, we're going to talk about uh, why the AIT only practice exam. We'll do a quick student poll, a uh, quick overview of the 2022 class schedules. <clears throat> then, right, what everyone's here for, we'll solve those four AIT practice problems together. Uh, and then I'll show you how to purchase the brand new practice exam at cost if you haven't already. Uh, again, I know most of you were probably already here last week, uh, so we won't spend as much time on these items as we did before, uh, but we'll touch on them briefly for anyone that's new. Does that sound good to everyone? All right. <clears throat> so again, uh, why make an AIT only practice exam? I'm going to minimize myself here so we can see the screen a little bit better. And I'm going to make the calculator go away for now. Great. Um, so yeah, again, why, why go through all the effort? Why spend two and a half years creating this AIT only practice exam? Uh, AIT practice problems are the new type of practice of problems that are now appearing on the CBT format of the PE exam. Uh, they include multiple corrects, right? A, B, C, D, and or E point and click, uh, maybe pointing on a graph, pointing on a, clicking on a part of a circuit, uh, drag and drop, typically matching labels to their correct devices or places. And then of course, fill in the blank where we're going to be really careful with those rounding techniques to make sure we're rounding at the very possible uh, last step for greater accuracy. So the biggest uh, reason behind making this AIT only practice exam is uh, until now, there was nothing really available to study from, right, in terms of AIT problems. The official NCEES practice exam, they converted four of their existing problems to AIT problems. And based on that, we can make a safe guess that when you actually take the PE exam, you're probably only going to see a few to a handful of AIT practice problems. But up until now, up until this AIT only practice exam, there just really hasn't been a lot to study from. Now, I like AIT practice problems are really challenging to make. And from a study perspective, when you're learning this material for the PE exam, that means they're going to be really challenging to learn, right? But the great thing about that is it's almost like learning more than one problem at a time, right? Uh, you're really going to have to not just understand these concepts, but really kind of internalize these concepts in order to answer these problems correctly, uh, especially the multiple correct, where you know it's no longer you have the option of selecting D for all of the above or none of the above. Now, any of those possible choices could be correct, and there's no partial credit. So if you've got something, like we'll see one tonight, uh, multiple correct, you know, A, B, C, D, and or E, if you don't select all of the correct uh, answer choices, then you get zero credit for that problem. So I'm a big fan of these AIT practice problems now. I think it's a fantastic way uh, to study for the PE exam. Again, uh, you're really just going to learn a lot more by working through an AIT practice problem uh, compared to just a standard, you know, old-fashioned, plain old boring multiple choice. <clears throat> Another good thing about it is now it's forcing us to really use our calculator properly uh, and round correctly, right? Rounding at the very last step and uh, using our, calcula our calculator to use all of the accuracy, right? All of those decimal places. And of course, I've got a lot of tricks uh, and I'll show you how to really get the, utilize your calculator the most to save you time. 
And after that, of course, the number one goal always is what? It's to help you pass the PE exam uh, again, which is really the sole intention of this book. All right, we'll do a quick student poll again, just like we did last week. Uh, I changed it up a little bit this time. Uh, so out of curiosity, who was here last week for the first free AIT webinar type one in the chat? Uh, let me know if you were here last week. Looks like JP, Matthew, Lewis, Alex R. Hey, Alex, Alex has been really, uh, really engaging in our uh, student, our new student message board. Great job, Alex. I uh, hope to see you keep it up throughout the semester. Uh, Z, Lewis, Josh, Apexa, Michelle, Sindhu, Carlo, Arturo. Good to see you again, Arturo. Uh, Kong, Pat Patix, Michael. Great. So quite a few of you were here last week. All right. Who here was not here last week? Type two. If this is your first time tuning in uh, for one of these free webinars as part of the book launch for AIT practice exam, when we're solving these AIT practice problems together, uh, who here is tuning in for the first time? All right. Let's see. I'm looking off uh, to the right in the chat. Uh, good. See quite a few of you. Looks like, um, is it Gotham? Did I pronounce your name right? G-A-U-T-H-A-M. Uh, Renjith, Chris, Kenneth, Alvin, Arnaldo, Chandler, Carmelo, Lola, Mina, Juan, Roman. Great. Quite a few of you attending for the first time. Welcome. I hope you guys uh, enjoy it. we got a lot of good stuff in store for you tonight. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun solving these AIT practice problems together. Right. Alvin said, already had the book. Great. Alvin, what do you think about it? What are your first impressions of, uh, of the book so far? All right, currently enrolled students, if you're currently enrolled in our online class, we're currently in the spring 2022 on-demand semester, go ahead, type three. How many enrolled students do we currently have in here tonight uh, that are working through the spring on-demand semester? Uh, let's see, and while I wait for those to come in in the chat, it looks like Z said, I bought the AIT practice exam. It's amazing. Great, great job, Zach. Excellent, Z. Happy to hear it. I like your uh, the initial for your name there, of course. Good. Alvin said it's awesome. Great. All right, let me see. I'm looking in the chat. Great. Lots of currently enrolled students. Pedro, Dalton, Kong, Jericho. Fantastic. Good to see you guys. Hope you guys are enjoying the spring 2022 on-demand semester. All right. Any former students out here, type four, you were enrolled in the past. Uh, you got this email in your inbox that said, hey, we're doing a free AIT webinar for the book launch. Uh, maybe you're curious to see what I'm up to, curious for uh, any new material we have out there. Uh, maybe you want to brush up on, uh, you know, your your familiarity with these subjects for your career, or maybe you're, you're just curious. So type four for any formerly enrolled students. And so we've got Michael, Arturo, Jose, and Tony. Great. Good to see you guys as well. <clears throat> uh, and is am I pronouncing it right? N-O-I-E-R, Noir. Did I say that right? All right. <clears throat> How about uh, where are the free trial users at? Type five. If you've, you've uh, enrolled in the free trial, obviously, to get on our, our email list. Otherwise, you wouldn't have received this invitation to join tonight. Uh, maybe you're not sure if you should enroll or not. Maybe you're just uh, you know trying to get as much free study material you can. Um, of course, nothing wrong with that either. You're going to learn a lot tonight. Uh, type five, if you're only enrolled in the free trial. Right. Looks like we got uh, Gotham, Chris, Chandler, Michelle, Lewis, Juan, Dennis, Issa, Sindhu. Great. Good to see you guys. Thank you for joining. All right. Um, any non-electrical engineers out of curiosity type six? Um, as you guys, most of you probably already know, the CBT results now, they're coming out every Wednesday. Uh, this week, um, there were two mechanical engineers uh, that passed the power exam with our program. Uh, so it's always excited when I hear that. That lets me know that, uh, you know, we're, we're presenting this material in a way that's really useful, uh, especially with people with no prior uh, background in electrical engineering. So any non-electrical engineers, let's, looks like Z. Z, what type of engineer are you, out of curiosity? Z type six. What type of engineer? And then uh, anyone else? If there's anyone else in the chat where any of these numbers during the student poll don't apply to you, let me know. Z said mechanical. Great. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to take a, a really quick look at our schedules for our class semesters. Talk about the difference between live and on demand, of course. Uh, talk about the upcoming 2022 semesters. We'll look at a little bit at the 2023. You guys ready? So every year I host four, uh, four separate cohort-based semesters every year. Uh, what is a cohort-based semester? 
pretty much that means you are in a group, kind of think of college, right? You're grouped in with everyone in our program that's taking the PE exam at the same time, right? Uh, again, we have one of the most engaged, active, and busy private message boards for the Power PE exam. Super useful. Uh, it's really helpful just to feel like you're not alone taking the PE exam. Uh, you know, a lot of times, even if you know someone else taking the PE exam, maybe they live in a different state, maybe they're studying on their own, maybe they're a different type of engineer taking a different type of PE exam, right? Well, the nice thing about being in a cohort with your peers is you're no longer in that by yourself. Uh, you got accountability partners with myself and the other students. Um, you kind of get to know everyone, myself included, but you get to know the other students. Uh, you know, we interact a lot on the message board. We uh, interact a lot during class, just like we are tonight in the in the live class chat room. It's just really useful to build that kind of community aspect, uh, just to feel like you're not in that by yourself, right? It's a, it's a great support uh, support system. Um, so out of those four cohort based semesters, uh, two of them are taught live in real time. That is the winter and summer semesters are taught live, right? We would connect uh, twice a week for about 11 weeks live, typically on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, no different than we're connecting right now. Um, I solve problems on the screen in real time. I take questions live in real time. Uh, it's very interactive. Uh, it's challenging, but it's also a lot of fun, as you'll probably hear from either current students or previously enrolled students. Uh, I promise you will learn way more than you think is possible uh, in just a 11 week up to three month program. We're going to learn uh, everything you can imagine about electrical engineering that you're going to be able to take with you, not just apply it to the PE exam, but you're also going to take it with you uh, in your career, too. It's going to be an invaluable experience. All right, after the winter and live, semesters, the spring and fall semesters are on demand. What's an on-demand semester? Pretty much it means I get to take a break uh, from teaching live. I get to get my, uh, my voice comes back. Uh, I get to work on exciting new content, just like this new book that we finally finished. And the on-demand semesters, we use the most recent live class recordings and we simulate a live semester by either dripping them out once a week if you're on the monthly subscription plan or for limited package students, of course, you know, uh, the whole thing is opened up to you and you can study from any uh, any class recording at any time. Uh, and on top of that, of course, you have whether or not you're a monthly subscription plan student or a limited package, you still have complete unrestricted access to the rest of our program. You know, the massive on-demand review course, you know, three to 400 practice problems, about the same number of on-demand videos, about, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes long, one problem at a time. Uh, you've got both boot camps that I see someone mentioned in the chat. Looks like Apexa said the circuit analysis and power fundamentals boot camp were great in reviewing the foundation. Been out of school for 17 years. Yeah, they are very powerful tools, especially to start if you don't know where to start. Um, you also have access to both practice exams, uh, the old one, or rather the new one, the AIT one, and uh, the old one that I actually have here on my desk, which we're actually in the, in the process of revising it for the new CBT format. Uh, so right now, we are currently in the spring 2022 on-demand semester, right? Spring 2022 goes from May to July. Then um, right at the end of July, we're going to start the summer live class semester. That's going to be from July to October. So July to October, we'll, we'll be meeting live every week, twice a week for about 11 weeks. And then at the end of October, we'll be rolling back into the last on-demand semester uh, for the year 2022, for the fall semester from October to December. Now, 2023 follows a similar pattern. This year, the schedule had to get pushed off a little bit. Again, if you're already a student or a former student or you're here last week, uh, you know why. Uh, but I got uh, I got married this year at the beginning of January. Um, so that kind of pushed off the start of the first semester for this year. Uh, and my wife and I took our honeymoon in the very middle of the first live semester. Um, so now that that's out of the way, next year, year 2023, every semester follows the calendar quarters. So quarter number one will be the winter live class semester from January to March. Quarter number two will be the spring on-demand semester from April to June. Quarter number three will be the summer live class semester from July to September. And the last quarter four, will be the fall on-demand semester from October to December. Let's see, Chris said, what time is live? Um, I've got it right here in the schedule. That's actually a really good question. Um, how about Chris? I'll wait to answer that. 
Um, this is the on-demand uh, schedule, but on the next screen, I have the semester, the live class semester schedule for next semester, so I'll show you. But it is uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time uh, is typically when we start. And uh, thank you, thank you for everyone saying congrats in the chat. Uh, it was very stressful planning a wedding, as I'm sure a lot of you, uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with. Uh, so it was nice kind of um, waiting to start this year's first live class semester until the until the wedding was over. Um, I want to say the first live class was like the week after our wedding. So it was nice to be able to, you know, uh, focus on my wife, focus on my family, focus on our, our ceremony, get that out of the way and then start fresh with all my attention on that first live semester. All right. So this is the current on demand schedule for the spring 2022 semester. Uh, remember, this is only if you're in the monthly subscri subscription plan, they're, they're released once a week. It simulates a live class semester. Um, so let's see, today is Friday, June 10th, right? 2022. So next week is right here for live class number seven will be released next week. So live class number one, introduction has already been released. Live class two, day one and day two, search analysis. Live class three, both days for Transformers class. Live class four, both days of induction and synchronous machines, which is really just, of course, rotating machines. Class number five, devices and power electronics. Class six, power factor correction and power flow. Next week, live class seven, transmission lines, voltage drop and voltage uh, regulation will be released. After that, class eight, per unit fault current analysis and symmetrical components. Symmetrical components, one of my favorite things to teach live. Uh, after that, protection class nine on the 27th. Then both days of live class number 10 applications are released on July 4th. Then the end of live class tests would be on July 11th with the last day of the spring on-demand semester on Sunday, July 17th. Again, on-demand semesters, only for monthly subscription plan students. If you're in the unlimited package, you can access any of the class recordings in any order that you see fit. Uh, monthly subscription plan students have to wait until it's released, but once it's released, you can go as far back as necessary uh, or say you, just, say you just enrolled right now, right today in the monthly subscription plan, you'd have access to classes one through six already, and then uh, you'd have to wait for the remaining uh, release schedule. All right, really quick, we're going to look at the next live semester schedule and then uh, what everyone's here for. We're going to solve those four new practice problems together. So um, the spring 2022 on-demand semester ends when? Ends July 17th, Sunday. So the following day, we'd be rolling right into the next uh, live class summer semester on Monday, July 18th. Uh, we use a rolling enrollment system, which means it doesn't matter what time you or what day you personally enroll, you'll automatically be grouped into the current semester. And um, there's a lot of rollover into the following semester. So uh, say your, uh, for whatever reason, your exam date's in the middle of a semester. Um, if your subscription is active, when we start a new semester, you're automatically carried in right into the next semester. So you you always get to participate and be part of the most, uh, most current cohort. All right. Um, for the question in the chat that was asking about what time is live, it looked like Chris asked that question. Uh, so the live class start time, depending on your time zone, over here on the right, uh, for Eastern time is 6 p.m. Central time is 5 p.m. Mountain time is 4 p.m. And Pacific time is 3 p.m. We generally go between three to four hours. Um, this year, we're gonna be, uh, I'm going to be trying out the next semester. I'm going to try to do the homework solutions on demand only, uh, listening to some of the feedback that came in. Uh, so we're really going to try to stick it to three hours per class this year. All right. Any questions on our semesters, on the schedules, on on-demand versus live class, anything like that before we get started and solve these four AIT practice problems together tonight? Any questions? Sindhu asked, that, what does it mean by ending July 18th? Sure. So July 18th, right here. Sorry, uh, July 17th is when it ends. If you meant by July 17th, would it be the end of the spring 2022 on-demand semester. 
So after Sunday, right, we'd be starting the next 2022 summer live class semester. So that's just the date when we roll from one semester to the next semester. It's when we transition from having just on-demand class recordings with the rest of our content uh, to offering every class live with me in real time twice a week. Does that make sense? Good question. All right. Any other questions before we jump into these uh, AIT problems tonight? Got a lot of really good problems tonight. I'm really excited to do these live. All right. Questions are slowing down in the chat. That is my cue, of course, to keep moving. And uh, looks like, well, one more question came in uh, from Chris. Uh, Chris said, how soon do the live recordings go up? I work during that time. Chris, great question. Uh, so for me, my work day is very late on live class days. Uh, typically, it's about three to four hours. And then immediately after a live class is finished, um, I post the recording to the student dashboard. And then I send out the announcement email to everyone in the class to let you know, hey, the live class recording is now available. Uh, so Chris, um, you can expect that within, within 30 minutes to an hour of each class ending, both day one and day two, that particular recording will be posted immediately to the student dashboard uh, so you can watch it pretty much as soon as we're finished. And of course, uh, you have unlimited unlimited replays and you can go back in the semester uh, to rewatch any class recordings that have already occurred. Does it make sense? Jericho said, just finish your live class recordings. I agree, reviewing homework not on live is a good idea. Yeah, Jericho, a lot of feedback came through. Um, you know, I know it's hard on you guys. It's hard on me too. When we, when, when class starts getting close to four hours, uh, it's just hard to pay attention. It's hard to absorb it. My voice starts to go, right? I get fatigued as well. Uh, yeah, so we're going to try that out uh, this coming semester and uh, we're going to see, see how, how it works. Uh, and if it, uh, if it works great, which I think it will, uh, we'll, we'll uh, continue to do that uh, moving forward. Good. Chris said, excellent. Thank you. Good. Chris, that answer your question? All right. All right, um, out of curiosity, who here was able to download these problems ahead of time? Who here is able to use that link? You can say, uh, you can say I did, you can say me, you can type one for yes. Anyone work, anyone uh, or rather download these ahead of time, give it your best shot, try to work them out. Good, quite a few of you. Alex Kong, Chandler, Carmelo, Mina, Tiffany, Gotham, Apexa, Chris. Great, good, quite a few of you. And it looks like, hey, uh, Mina, Gotham, Dennis, check your chat settings. You're on uh, just host and panelists. So only I can see what you're typing in, in the chat. Uh, if you click, for me, it's a drop down arrow right above where I type the message. It says two. Um, hit that drop down arrow and it should say, should say everyone rather. I think earlier I said host and panelists. So I misspoke. Yeah, you want to make sure it's clicked on everyone, everyone. All right, you guys ready? It's uh, what everyone's here for, right? <clears throat> so we're gonna solve some AIT practice problems together. And these are directly from the brand new AIT practice exam. Uh, last week, we solved three together. Again, um, tonight we're gonna try to solve four. Uh, I think we can get all four done within the hour. I'm very hopeful. Might go a few minutes over, but I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, and these, of course, are a brand new set of problems compared to last week. All right, you guys ready? So problem 28 says a capacitor is placed in parallel with a DC load. Can you guys see my cursor? With a DC load fed by a single phase half wave uncontrolled rectifier. Select all statements below that are true. All right, so this is a select all AIT problem, right? It's not just one of these. It could be any combination of A, B, C, D, and or E. All right, those of you that downloaded this ahead of time, let me know, what do you think? What answer did you get? So you can type in something like A, B, C, or B and D, or C and E, or maybe all five, right? A, B, C, D, and E. Let me know in the chat. Did anyone uh, attempt this ahead of time? Let's see, Jericho asks, any chance we have access to the class you did last week? Yep, Jericho, it's posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, we also sent an email out with the link to it. Uh, if you're not sure if that email popped up in your spam folder or your promotions folder, uh, if you go to um, just go to YouTube, type in electrical PE review, it'll be our most recent video. All right, we got a brave soul. Alex said A, B, and D. A, B, and D. All right, anyone else? A, B, and D. 
All right, Alex, you're the brave one in here tonight. Um, this is uh, this is a tough problem, though. Uh, so if you're not sure, if you're waiting for someone else to respond, don't worry. Uh, this is a great problem to really understand the uh, ripple peak to peak ripple voltage formula. Joshua said A, B, D, and E. A, B, D, and E. Great. All right. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to give you a quick crash course on some of what we cover live during devices and power electronics class. So first of all, this material is in the NCES reference handbook. You're looking for AC to DC converters on page 44 to 45. Uh, and then you're looking at the time constant for DC circuits on page 34. And of course, we cover this live extensively in class five power electronics. Um, so I'm going to do a quick summary of an uncontrolled single phase half wave rectifier. Uh, we're going to look at these formulas together. And then on the next page, we're going to use these relationships that we're about to review to either prove or disprove each of those possible answer choices. Now, one of the things we hear a lot is the, you know, expect qualitative questions or lots of qualitative questions on the PE exam. <clears throat> one of my favorite things to teach is how we can use formulas use these relationships to solve qualitative problems. I like to say that, that these are really quantitative problems, right? Quantitative with numbers or with math. These are quantitative problems disguised. They're disguised as qualitative problems. So we're going to look at some graphs. We're going to look at the formula that formulas that apply to this problem. And we're going to show that it's pretty much a quantitative problem just without any numbers, right? I'll show you what I mean by that. All right, so over here on the left, we've got our circuit. So how do we know it's a single phase half wave uncontrolled rectifier, right? First of all, single phase, how many AC inputs do I have over here on the left? I only have one AC input. That's Vs of T, right? Or the source or supply voltage with respect to time, right? There's only one phase here. Half wave, <clears throat> anyone know what a half wave rectifier is? That means we're only gonna have how many diodes? We're only gonna have one, right? One diode. And we're only gonna be passing the positive peak of that AC input. So before we add the capacitor, we have a positive peak, zero, positive peak, zero, positive peak, zero, over and over and over again, right? That's a half wave rectifier. Last, what the heck is an uncontrolled rectifier? Uncontrolled just means that the piece of power electronics, uh, power electronic hardware that's being used, in this case, it's a diode, we cannot control when the diode closes and opens. It's going to happen automatically according to diode characteristics, which is pretty much as soon as there's a voltage drop across it. So that's it. Single phase, half wave, uncontrolled rectifier. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to zoom in here, and we're going to look at the graph of the input in red and the output in orange that I'm going to draw here on the screen. <clears throat> All right, our input, red, the supply voltage, right? <clears throat> it's just a typical AC sine wave. It's going to go from zero to its positive peak, Vm. M stands for maximum. It's going to go back down to zero. And it's going to go all the way down to the minimum peak or negative one times V maximum. And it's going to go back to zero, right? That's one period of an AC sine wave repeated over and over and over again. All right, now I'm going to change my pen color to orange. Since we're using orange on the screen for VO of T, this is the output voltage with respect to time. Down below, does everyone see this gray dashed positive peaks only? This gray dashed, I'm gonna use that as a guide to draw this. But these gray dashed lines would be our output voltage without the capacitor, right? Only the positive peaks right here would be passed and the negative peaks are blocked. Then when we add a capacitor, a filtering capacitor, it's going to help smooth out the output voltage. It's going to make it more like DC, right? True DC is a flat horizontal line. Without the capacitor, we just have positive peaks, right? When we add the capacitor, it's going to get a lot closer to a horizontal straight line. <clears throat> All right, so here's what that's going to look like. 
Assuming right at zero, we turn the circuit on, the capacitor is gonna to start to charge. And the output voltage is gonna follow the first positive peak. After that, the capacitor is going to discharge. Let's make this a little bit more, there we go, like a sine wave. After that, the capacitor is going to discharge. It's gonna look like this. It's gonna be a horizontal decreasing line right here. So that pattern is just gonna repeat over and over and over. Here's the capacitor charging again. Let me see if I can draw a nice curve here. Here's the capacitor charging again. And now the capacitor is going to discharge. Try, try that one more time. <clears throat> Here we go. Now the capacitor is discharging. And this pattern is gonna repeat over and over and over. So here's our output voltage with the parallel filter capacitor or the parallel smoothing capacitor. <clears throat> So this right here is gonna be our DC output, VO with respect to time T. <clears throat> All right, let's look at the charging versus discharging properties of the capacitor. We can say from here all the way to here, what's happening? Is the capacitor charging or discharging during this boundary that I just drew in blue from the VM maximum voltage to the minimum voltage, that horizontal decaying voltage signal? What is the capacitor doing? Yeah, the capacitor is discharging. Let's see, good job, Pedro, Kenneth, Chandler, Alex, Omer, Lola, fantastic. Yeah, we can say the capacitor is discharging. It's supplying current to the DC load and it's acting as the voltage source. During that time, it's open circuiting this diode. It's reverse biasing this diode, turning this into an open circuit and the capacitor is supplying current to our load. And our load, we can show that would look like what? Just a resistor, right? A DC load is typically just an impedance without a reactance, right? Here's our resistor, which would be the DC load. <clears throat> All right, so if that's when the capacitor is discharging, what's happening when the voltage increases again? So when the voltage, the output voltage goes from the minimum voltage, V minimum, back to V maximum, Vm. What's happening here? I'm gonna draw this way down here so I've got room. Well, we could say process of elimination, right? If it was discharging before, then I know it's gotta be, yeah, it's charging. Pedro says it charges. Kenneth said ca capacitor is charging. Lola said charging. Yeah, great. So this is when the capacitor is charging, right? Now, instead of the capacitor supplying current to the resistor, now the diode is short-circuited, it's forward biased. We've got a current flowing from our source through the diode. The handbook calls that ID for the diode current. Now the capacitor is drawing charging current, right? It's acting like a load, it's charging. And the rest of the current would be our output current. That's what it looks like when it's charging. And again, this just, repeats itself over and over and over. So here would be the next discharging period right here. Here's the charging right here. And this period just repeats, right? Just cycles over and over and over. <clears throat> Let's see, we'll draw the last discharging right here. Now, why are we talking about this? 
we're going to end up using all of this to evaluate those A, B, D, C, and or E possible answer choices. All right, I'm going to switch my pen over to purple just so we can have some contrast on the screen. All right, so here's a peak to peak of ripple voltage that's available, the formula that's available in the reference handbook, right? Delta VO of T is our peak to peak ripple voltage. VM, that's our maximum voltage, right? F is the frequency, R is our DC resistance, C is the capacitance. Be really careful here. What's an easy mistake to make? Capacitance is not what? Capacitance is not capacitive reactance, right? This is not, NOT, not capacitive reactance. It's a difference in units, right? Capacitive reactance is X of C in the unit of ohms, right? It's the imaginary component of impedance. This is capacitance C in units of farads F. Just be really careful there. You can do everything right, but if you use capacitive reactants and ohms instead of capacitance and farads, you're going to get the problem wrong. All right, so how can we visualize the peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage? <clears throat> Remember before I said uh, without the smoothing capacitor, we would just have these positive peaks here dashed in gray, right? Now the smoothing capacitor kind of looks more like a sawtooth, right? Uh, but it's a lot flatter than it was before. So let's draw where the peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage is on this graph. So I'm going to draw a straight line from our maximum voltage right here, right? And this purple dot is our maximum voltage. And I'm going to draw a straight line from our minimum voltage, V min, right here. So this value from here to here is going to be delta VO, right? This is the peak to peak ripple voltage. Now, careful, this formula I'm about to show you is not in the reference handbook, but we can figure it out pretty easily. You know what else is not in the reference handbook? On their version of this graph, they do not show V minimum, okay? Looking at this graph, who wants to take a guess? How do we solve for the peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage, delta VO, compared to V maximum, right, VM, and V minimum? No one want to take a guess at that? How do we solve for the peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage in relation to the maximum and minimum voltage? Yeah, good job, Omer. Omer, who else? Kenneth, great job. Chandler said subtract. Yeah, we just take the difference. Delta VO is equal to the maximum voltage, VM, minus the minimum voltage, V minimum, right? If V maximum is from zero to here, and V minimum is from zero to here, then delta VO, our peak to peak ripple voltage, is going to be this value minus this value. See how easy that is? Now, it's interesting, the reference handbook, their use of this variable delta. What does delta typically mean? Not, not an electrical delta, not a three-phase delta connection, uh, but just in general in math. Delta means what? Delta means difference. Yeah, who got that? Good job, Kong. Great job. Delta means difference. D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-C-E. -E. What does the word, excuse me, what does the word difference mean in math? When we take the difference of something, we're doing subtract. Good job, Omer. Yeah, we're subtracting. We're taking the difference between the maximum and minimum output voltage. That's all the peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage is. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> Down below, time constant for an RC circuit is just the resistance times the capacitance. That's going to come in handy on the next page when we solve this problem. And down here, again, not in the reference handbook. It's the same formula right here that we just solved for, except we're setting it equal to the minimum voltage. I've got delta VO, and I want to solve for the minimum voltage. Can I rewrite that? Can I say V minimum equals V maximum minus delta VO? Remember, really important, 
It's not in the reference handbook. But does everyone feel comfortable looking at that graph, even if they don't label what the minimum is on that graph in the reference handbook? Everyone feel comfortable, right? We can look at that graph. We can easily come up with that relationship. Maybe we're having a hard time remembering under the stress of the exam. Then we see the delta symbol and we remember, ah, delta means difference. Difference means subtraction, right? We can get that right from the graph. All right, that's my 10 minute crash course on peak to peak ripple voltage and single phase half wave uncontrolled rectifiers. We're gonna use all of this that we just learned and we're gonna solve problem number 28. Are you guys ready? We're gonna do it one step at a time. All right, choice A, the peak to peak ripple voltage is inversely proportional to the farad rating of the capacitor. Hmm. Here's our peak to peak ripple voltage. Where's the farad rating? Remember, farads is capacitance, capital C, and the unit of farad, right? That's this guy right here. What happens if my capacitance in farad increases? So if it goes up, what happens to the peak to peak ripple voltage? Capacitance is on the bottom of that fraction. So if it gets bigger, delta VO has to decreases. Yeah, it goes down. Okay. Next, what happens instead if the capacitance rating decreases? What happens to delta VO or peak to peak ripple voltage? Again, capacitance, it's on the bottom of the fraction. So if the bottom of that fraction gets smaller, we're dividing by a smaller amount than delta VO. Yeah, it gets bigger. Good job, Tiffany. Gets bigger. So is this true or false? Is this an inversely proportional relationship? Is this inversely proportional? Yeah, it sure is. This is true, right? Inversely proportional. Um, I think the classic way to write this, like as a math expression, is any variable y equals some constant, unchanging constant k divided by x. Here, y would be delta VO. X would be C, and K would be everything else that's being held constant. K would be our maximum voltage VM divided by frequency times resistance. That is an inversely proportional relationship. A is true. All right, are we done? Did we solve the problem? Did we solve the problem? Can we move on? Be really careful. No, says Kenneth Lola. Not yet, says Omar. Why not? What kind, of, what kind of AIT problem is this? Select what? Select all statements below that are true. Select all that apply. Again, easy way, you're taking the exam, you're stressed, you've been studying for however many months, you got a lot on the line. Most of the problems are multiple choice. Careful, if you just, oh, I found the answer and move on, you might not have gotten it right, right? If any of the other ones are true and you didn't realize it was select all that apply, you'd be in, you'd be in tough shape. All right, let's evaluate B. Uh, B says the peak to peak ripple voltage as a percentage of the maximum output voltage will decrease proportionately as the DC load resistance increases. All right, what exactly is the peak to peak ripple voltage as a percentage of the maximum output voltage? Sounds confusing. It's really simple. They're asking about the ratio of delta VO to VM, the maximum voltage. Can I move the maximum voltage VM to the bottom of delta VO and replace this with, with a one? I sure can, right? I haven't broken any rules yet. Next, instead of a decimal, if I want a percentage, can I just multiply this formula by 100%? Sure can, haven't broken any rules. The peak to peak ripple voltage as a percentage of the maximum output voltage. All that means is delta VO to VM times 100%, right? It's a ratio. It's just a ratio. <clears throat> All right, so let's rewrite this. We've got delta VO. The ratio of delta VO or peak to peak ripple voltage to the maximum voltage equals one over frequency times resistance 
times capacitance. And we can convert from a decimal to a percentage just by including times 100. All right, let's evaluate it. What happens as our DC resistance increases? Or is our DC resistance right here? As the DC resistance increases, what happens to the peak to peak ripple voltage as a percentage of the maximum output voltage? If R goes up, this whole thing has to go down. Yeah, it's got to go down. <clears throat> now, is it going to be proportional? If R doubles, will delta VO over VM decrease by half? Sure will, right? So this is true. This is also true. What's a better way of saying decrease proportionally? This is also what kind of relationship? I'm going to circle it, or rather, I'm going to draw a square around it. This is what? Yeah, this is inversely proportional. This is really another way of asking for an inverse proportional relationship. Inversely proportional. Why is that important? There's different words they can use to ask you to evaluate these relationships. Is it inversely proportional? Will one variable, where's my hand? Will one variable decrease proportionally with this other variable? Same thing, different way to ask for it. Make sense? All right, we've got A and B are true so far. Let's look at C. C asks, the time constant of the circuit is directly proportional to the peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage. We know what the peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage is, right? That's delta VO. What's the time constant tau equal? Tau equals what? R times C. Here's tau. Let's rewrite it. Delta VO, peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage equals VM over our frequency times tau. All right. Is this directly proportional, delta VO to tau? Is this directly proportional? Like B and A were also, I'm sorry, B and A were inversely proportional. So is delta VO and tau directly proportional? No, right? It's false. Instead of being directly proportional, delta VO and tau are what? Inversely, it says rule. Yeah, this is another example of inversely proportional. Make sense? So C is our first false answer choice. All right, D. As the capacitance rating, remember capacitance, that's going to be C in the unit of farads, not capacitive reactance in ohms. As the capacitance increases, the minimum output voltage increases. All right, here's the formula in the handbook. Here's the formula, again, not in the handbook, but we feel comfortable deriving it now based on what we just did on the last page. So let's see, I'm going to circle capacitance. As capacitance increases, what happens to delta VO, our peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage, as capacitance goes up? Capacitance goes up, delta VO does what? Yeah, delta VO decreases, gets smaller. Over here, as delta VO gets smaller, what happens to V minimum? Does V minimum get bigger or smaller now that the peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage has gotten smaller? If, if the maximum voltage doesn't change, and we decrease how much we're subtracting from it, then our minimum voltage is going to get bigger, says Omer. Yeah, it's going to increase, says Lowland Rule. Yeah, it's going to increase. All right, what does the problem say? As the capacitance increases, the minimum output voltage also increases. Is this true? As C gets bigger, does VM also get bigger? Sure does. <clears throat> so D is also true. Now, I want to be really, we want to be really careful here. While this is true, what kind of relationship is this not? Is this directly proportional? Is this directly proportional? Typically, directional proportion, uh, uh, directly proportional when one goes up, 
the other goes up. And when one goes down, the other goes down, right? Is this directly proportional? Careful, Omer. No, this is not. This is not directly proportional. So directly proportional is for any variable y, we've got some unchanging constant k times our other variable x, right? In other words, if x doubles, y doubles. If x halves, y halves. While these are inversely proportional, notice how uh, delta VO and V minimum are not, right? Rather, let's see, I think I should have said uh, inversely proportional. But you realize how when we make delta VO smaller, V minimum does not get bigger by that same factor. So yeah, not directly proportional. It's not inversely proportional, rather. Does everyone see why? If we decrease delta VO, V minimum won't necessarily increase by that same factor, right? Because it's not division anymore. It's just subtraction. Gotham said, would it be considered linear? Um, no, right? Because linear is a one-for-one one change. So linear would be directly proportional. Good question. Why am I pointing this out? If D said the capacitance, capa is capacitance and minimum voltage inversely proportional? Some people might be tempted to say true, or right, even though it's not. Wait a minute, it is directly proportional. I'm looking at not inversely proportional because we're looking at capacitance increasing with V minimum. All right, I'm gonna, we're gonna back that up one more time. So it's directly proportional, I was trying to compare to. I got confused looking at uh, delta VO and V minimum, directly proportional. Right. In other words, if C doubles, does V minimum automatically double? No, right? Because this isn't multiplication and, and, and division, it's subtraction. Sorry for the confusion. Does that make sense though? In other words, we might be tempted to say yes for directly proportionality, even though it's not, even though they're both either getting bigger or getting smaller, right? Capacitance C and V minimum, it's not necessarily directly proportional. Does that make better sense? All right, last one. Uh-oh, I thought we were going to be done in an hour. <clears throat> Looks like you guys are getting uh, getting a better show tonight. <laughs> All right, E, um, diode current decreases as the capacitance rating of the capacitor increases. Hmm. Here's our graph, right? I'm going to copy what we did before, and we're going to paste this right on top of this graph. We've got to be really comfortable with charging and discharging cycles of this capacitor in order to solve this properly. All right, diode current decreases as the capacitance increases. What happens to our peak-to-peak -peak ripple voltage as capacitance increases? What does delta VO do? Delta VO is going to decrease, right? Capacitance is on the bottom of that fraction. So as it gets bigger, delta VO has to get smaller. <clears throat> when delta VO gets smaller, how does that affect the diode current? Let's scroll back to that circuit. Here's the diode current. Who can tell me? The diode current is really just what? It's the current being supplied by the AC power supply. When is the only time the AC power supply supplies a current? Is it when the capacitor is discharging or when the capacitor is charging like it's shown right now? It's only when the capacitor is charging. Yeah, good job, Kenneth, JP, Arnaldo. Yeah, when the capacitor is discharging, the diode's open. It's reverse biased. No current can flow through an open circuit. However, when the capacitor is charging, it's drawing in that charging current. The diode is forward biased and it's closed. So that diode current ID only flows when the capacitor is charging. So what happens when we increase the capacitance rating really big 
And look, here's the here's the peak to peak ripple voltage, right? When I increase capacitance, this peak to peak gets smaller, right? V minimum increases until it approaches what? Until it approaches Vm, our maximum voltage. Let's draw a worst case scenario. So if our peak to peak ripple voltage equals zero, right? Our capacitance is so big that the peak to peak is infinitely small. It's almost zero. What does V minimum equal in that case? If the value from here to here is zero, V minimum equals, yeah, V maximum. Good job, JP, equals V max. Let's draw all that. What does that look like? Our new output would be what? Once the capacitor charges, delta VO is zero. Here's our new V out with respect to T. Does that make sense? In other words, our capacitor charges initially from when the circuit is turned on until the first peak. And after that, what? After that, the capacitor never has to charge again. It's so big that it never depletes itself. It's gonna be discharging for the rest of the time. So if the capacitor is discharging for the rest of the time that circuit's on, what's gonna to happen to our diode current? The diode current is gonna decrease and it's gonna what? It's gonna approach zero. I of D is going to approach zero as V minimum approaches V maximum. So is E true? Will the diode current decrease as we increase the capacitance? Sure would, right? We just looked at a worst case scenario. Sure would. So the answer here is A, B, D and E. Look, that was all one problem. If we didn't select all four of those choices, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get credit. We wouldn't get partial credit. Now look at this. Did we really solve one problem? We might have solved one AIT problem, but how many conditions did we just have to evaluate? A, B, C, D, and E. It was like evaluating five problems or five conditions. Do you see why I like these AIT practice problems? They're great for learning. If you're comfortable with A, B, D, uh, A, B, C, D, and E, you've got it. You've got peak to peak ripple voltage with this circuit. You understand it completely for the PE exam. All right, let's see. It's seven o'clock. So I was way off base. Um, I thought we could solve one more problem compared to last week and still make it in on an hour. Um, this problem took a lot more time to solve than anticipated. Uh, the other problems are a lot quicker. How are you guys feeling? Um, I'm happy to continue if you guys would like me to. Uh, we've got three more problems. We've got a drag and drop for rotating machines. We've got another select all that apply for voltage drop. And we've got a really fun power flow that looks really scary, but it's really quick and easy to solve. How are you guys feeling? Z says, please continue. A Apex says, continue. All right. I like it. We're going to march on. <clears throat> so uh, next problem, drag and drop. Problem number 37 says, drag the label of each description to the appropriate place on the induction torque versus speed curve shown below. First of all, when we're, I'm, I'm going to zoom in here. Let's see, make sure I'm not blocking anything important. Great. <clears throat> What's the difference between an induction motor versus an induction generator in terms of speed, in terms of rotor speed, I should say? What's the difference? What's the rotor speed of a motor compared to the synchronous speed of the stator? 
uh, faster, slower, or the same? How does a rotor spin inside of a induction motor? Uh, Gotham said a rotor speed is behind synchronous speed in motor. Ooh, Stefan said faster, careful, slower, right? If I have an 1800 RPM motor, then the actual speed of the rotor is probably gonna be like 1760 or something similar. It's gonna be slightly slower. An induction motor, the rotor is getting lapped, right? The stator is speed spinning and the rotor just can't quite keep up with it. So it's getting lapped. And that's where the torque comes from. Johnny said probably around 750 or so. Yeah, exactly. We could have 1800 RPM. That's the speed of the magnetic field and the stator synchronous speed N of S. Our actual rotor speed end would be you know, around uh, 1750 RPMs. All right, how about a generator? What's the relationship between the speed of the rotor and the speed of the synchronous speed, the rotating magnetic field that we can't see in the stator? Faster, says Stefan. Yeah, you got it. This time the rotor's spinning so fast. It's spinning faster than the magnetic poles and the rotating magnetic field in the stator. So it's going to push out that power as a source instead of draw that power in as load. All right, over here on our torque versus speed curve. These curves vary depending on the type of uh, the torque versus speed curve characteristics. Easiest example is your, your different NEMA letter design motors, you know, uh, A, B, D, E, F, that kind of thing. The relationship between how the torque responds to speed is going to slightly vary depending on that. So this curve, depending on what type of motor it is, right, it's going to look a little different but all the main points are the same. All right, um, question. What's my, so if I've got torque on top, speed over here, right, in RPMs, what's my speed right here? What speed is this? This is what, N equals how much? N equals zero, says Kenneth. Yep, N equals to zero. How about uh, this point right here? What speed is this? NS, great job, Z. Yeah, this is synchronous speed, NS. Um, typically, maybe right around here, give or take some. Do you want to take out, what speed is this? Full load, says Z, great. What variable do we use for full load speed? N, yeah, here's, here's N. Slightly slower than synchronous speed, just for a motor, right? <clears throat> All right. N equals to zero corresponds with which of these conditions? Synchronous speed, braking, generating, breakdown, or locked rotor? Locked rotor, says Josh Button. Yeah. What does locked rotor mean? Locked rotor is when the motor is at a standstill. It's not moving, says Kong. Yeah, exactly. Not moving. Either we haven't started it yet or the motor seized up, right? Think of a cement plant. You've got an agitator motor, kind of think of a heavy duty blender. And uh, that cement, they make a mistake and the cement hardens and that motor is energized, but it's seized up and it can't move. That's also a locked rotor condition. All right, there's our first choice. That point is locked rotor, right? How about up here? What's the torque at this point right here? This is our what? This is our maximum torque, right? We can call this T max or T sub B for breakdown. Yeah, good job, Johnny. Let's break down. What does breakdown mean? Is the machine breaking down? Is it getting damaged? No, right? All breakdown means is it's the maximum torque. Notice it's the highest point on the vertical axis. It's the point on the curve before the torque starts to break down and decrease. So it doesn't mean the machine's breaking, doesn't mean, mean there's any damage, it just means the torque is starting to decrease and drop down, that's all. All right, there's breakdown. What speed is this right here at the point of breakdown? This is what, we can say N sub B, right? For the speed of the rotor at the momentary point of breakdown. Breakdown is when all that friction has just overcome and now there's less friction to keep that motor spinning. Um, so the torque also drops off. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Here's an easy one. We said this point on the horizontal axis was our synchronous speed. 
So that's an easy one, right? Process of elimination. Here's synchronous speed. All right, we've got two left. From the vertical axis in the left horizontal direction, what happens to n? Remember, n is the variable for a horizontal axis. So if this was an x and y graph, then x would be what on the left side of that graph? x would be negative, right? So this is when our rotor speed is less than zero. It's negative, or it's spinning in the what? The rotor is spinning in the opposite direction. If the rotor is spinning in the opposite direction, so normally the stator is moving, say, for me, this is clockwise. Um, I think this looks counterclockwise on the screen, doesn't it? So we'll say counterclockwise. So if the poles are spinning counterclockwise in the stator, the rotor is going to also want to move counterclockwise. What happens if the rotor spins clockwise while the stator poles are trying to spin it counterclockwise? It's going to be doing what? Yeah, it's going to be breaking. Good job, Kenneth and Josh. This is breaking, slowing down as fast as possible. A tremendous amount of, it's generating a tremendous amount of heat. It's a fighting, opposing those poles. Only special motors are designed for braking. All right, last one, process of elimination. But before we drag it in there, let's do the same thing over here. N is less than zero to the left. Right here in the middle, N equals zero. Everything in the right direction, we know if N was less than zero and negative, now we know in the right direction, N is what? N is greater than zero and positive, right? Right at this point right here, what does our N value equal? Right here, N equals what? Synchronous speed. Uh, what happens when N equals synchronous speed to the torque? What's my value of torque if I draw a line all the way back to the vertical axis? Torque equals zero. Good job, Apexa. Yep, torque equals zero. Anytime after this point, what is N equal? Any, anywhere to the right of this point, N equals, or rather we can say, how about N is greater than synchronous speed? What happens if we have an induction machine and we hook something up to the rotor and we drive the rotor faster than synchronous speed? We've got a generator. We've got a generator. We've got an induction generator. Ta-da. Drag and drop. Now, I took my time kind of working through this problem, but if you're familiar with this curve or with this curve and these characteristics, it's just a quick one, two, three, four, five. It's real quick if you're familiar with this. All right, if you're looking for more, um, four, two, four in the reference handbook on page 56. Uh, and then we talk about torque for speed uh, heavily in class four induction and synchronous machines. Great job, uh, great promises, Tony. I saw someone in there uh, tonight had a light bulb moment. Pedro, Pedro said light bulb moment. Pedro, what was your light bulb moment on this one? What was your light bulb moment for this problem? All right, while I wait for uh, Pedro in the chat, I'm gonna scroll down to our next AIT problem. Breaking, said Pedro, great. Um, I've only seen, I wanna say one or two motors in person uh, that had braking capabilities. Uh, one of them was a mechanical braking uh, with a really heavy duty kind of clutch around the shaft. And the other was uh, electrical braking, but they also use power electronics so that you're not just slamming full voltage in the opposite direction, which would probably wreck your motor. Um, I, I don't really see that as often. VFDs have really just changed everything in, in modern motor application person where now you can, VFD, you can just slow it down with the voltage. All right. <clears throat> Problem 84 from our new AIT practice, uh, practice exam. 84 says, select the statements below that are true if n number of equal conductors are connected in parallel for each phase to supply power to a load. All right, what kind of AIT problem is this? Select all statements below that are true. So it's another what? It's another select all that apply. We've got to be really careful. About our, we've got to take our time and really evaluate A, B, C, D, and or E. Any of these could be true. They could all be true. None of them could be true. Or any combination of them could be true. And there's no partial credit. Um, if you get a multiple correct, uh, 
problem on the real P exam and you're running in circles, just skip it. An AIT problem, it's worth the same amount of points as a regular problem. If it's easy, don't be afraid to, to work on it. But if it's hard, skip it and come back to it. All right, A says the voltage drop across each phase will increase by a factor of N. B says voltage drop will decrease by a factor of N. C says current flowing through each conductor increase by a factor of N. D says current flowing through each conductor will decrease by a factor of N. E says the equivalent line impedance for each phase will decrease by a factor of N. All right, let me know in the chat who worked this out ahead of time. What do you got? Give me the letters in the chat. Josh says B, D, and E. Alex R says B, C, and E. Anyone else? Any other brave souls? Who, uh, who's not sure? So you're waiting to see who, uh, what else gets, gets put in the chat before, uh, before you, you um, put your answer. Um, Johnny says, if there is none are true as an answer, then at least one has to be true, right? I can't just leave it blank. Uh, let's see, John said, if there is none are true, uh, not necessarily. I, so I, I don't, I don't expect to see like all the above or none of the above in a, in an all that apply AIT problem. So that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, but if they give you that possible answer choice and then there is there, and you know, for a fact, one is true, then obviously none are true is not their correct answer, but you still have to evaluate if any of the, if any of the other ones are true. So this is really just a, you know, multiple choice problem on steroids, right? So really these are Really time consuming. <clears throat> All right. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. So some more came in. Chong said B, C, and E. Chandler said B, D, and E. Stefan said B, D, and E. Michael said B, D, and E. Great. Anyone cheating? Anyone here already worked this in the AIT practice uh, practice exam? Uh, this, is a, this is one of my favorite problems in the new book. Uh, really helps with voltage drop. Uh, there's a similar problem in the official NCES practice exam. Uh, with uh, two conductors per phase. Let's see, Tiffany said B, D, and E. Anthony says E. All right, really important. What's the relationship between the different conductors being used? All the conductors are what? Equal, right? Or they're all, they're all the same. Um, you know, common application of this in the industry is instead of buying a 500 MCM cable and having your contractors pull that, uh, you get two, right? Just double up, get two 250 KCML cables. Typically it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be easier to pull, right? Um, all the, this is just parallel conductors. All it is. They're the same conductors in, in parallel. All right. Um, we cover this in class seven transmission lines and voltage drop. And, uh, in the reference handbook voltage drop is five one one page 66. Really not nothing in the reference handbook really helps you here. Uh, but with a little bit of circuit analysis, this is, this is pretty easy. So I copied a graphic from the solution in the book, but uh, we're going to uh, derive this relationship ourselves. So I'm just going to copy and paste something really quick from my notes. <clears throat> All right. Over here on the left, and we're going to zoom way in. because We're going to write a lot. <clears throat> Over here on the left, I've got one conductor per phase. That conductor has an impedance of Z, right? The load draws current I. Now, over here, uh, in this particular diagram on the right, we've got three of the same conductor Z, right? So same complex impedance in parallel. No change to the load current I being delivered by the power supply to the load, right? This I is the same I as before. Now, <clears throat> how do we calculate over here on the left, how do we calculate the equivalent impedance for parallel conductors or parallel loads or parallel impedances? How do we add these up? In series, we just sum them, right? Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3. In parallel, we have to use what's called the reciprocal of the reciprocal sums method, right? If you're in my class, a lot of times you'll see me just write this notation for parallel. When you got two, it's easy to just multiply on top and sum them up on bottom, right? Uh, when you have more than two, it's easier to see this relationship as using the, the long format. 
In other words, if I've got three equal conductors in parallel over here on the right, how do I derive this relationship for ZEQ? I've got one over one over Z plus one over Z, right? Plus one over Z. In other words, it's the reciprocal of the reciprocal sums. That's where that word comes from. All right, how do I simplify this? How do I simplify this? One over one over Z plus one over Z plus one over Z. How about on the bottom of this fraction, what is, I've got three equal things, right? One over Z adding to itself three times. If that was just a variable X, right? If I had X plus X plus X, well, then that would just be three X, right? Instead, I've got one over Z plus one over Z plus one over Z. Now I just have, how about three times one over Z? See that? Same thing. All right, how do I simplify this? One over three doesn't change, right? If I've got a fraction on the bottom of the fraction, I can take this guy on the bottom and move it all the way to the top, right? I haven't broken any rules by doing that. Here's one divided by, one divided by Z is the same thing as Z on the top of the first fraction. So this right here is equal to just complex Z over three. What did N equal for this case? What was our N? If we had three conductors in parallel for N number of conductors. Yeah, N was three, says JP and Lola and Kenneth. Yeah, N was three. So look, if I have, and this, this only works if the conductors are identical, right? The same complex impedance, that same conductor. That's the same thing as the impedance of the original conductor divided by the number of equal conductors in parallel. Z equivalent equals the impedance of each individual equal conductor divided by the number of equal conductors. Does that make sense? Light bulb moment for anyone? <clears throat> All right, let's look at what happens to the voltage drop. Then we'll look at what happens to the conductor current. And then that's all we need to solve this problem. JP says, yes, good, glad to hear it. All right, let's compare what happens to the voltage drop. So voltage drop, we're just gonna use, uh, we're gonna use Ohm's law. Ohm's law says V equals I times Z. And instead of Z over here, I wanna use Z equivalent, right? The equivalent impedance shown by this dashed box, Z EQ. So I will say one thing, look, I've got a V over here on the left and a V on the right. So it's the same variable, but these are two different voltage drops. We can call this a V, how about we'll call this VZ and we'll call this VZ equivalent. Is that better? So over here, we're solving for VZ equivalent. We're solving for this voltage drop with our parallel conductors. Uh, it drives me crazy when books are not consistent like that. So I tried to avoid it. It can be confusing. All right, um, can I plug in that relationship we just figured out for the equivalent impedance, ZEQ? What does ZEQ equal? It equals the impedance divided by N number of conductors, right? What happens as N increases? As I add more conductors in parallel, what happens to the new voltage drop? from my source to my load, what happens to the voltage drop? N goes up, yeah, V goes down. So what happens to my voltage drop? It's going to increase or decrease by a factor of N. Decrease says rule, yeah. Our new voltage drop is going to decrease by a factor of n, right? In other words, we are dividing by n, decreasing by a factor of n. What kind of relationship is this? If i and z don't change, what kind of relationship is this? Is this directly proportional or is this 
Yeah, inversely. This is inversely proportional. Good job, Kenneth and Johnny. All right, last one. We're going to look at the current. And then we've got everything we need to solve this problem. We'll call it step C. We want to look at the current flowing through each conductor. So not the current being supplied by the power source, which is going to equal the current drawn into the load, right? We want to look at the current flowing through each conductor. All right, same thing, Ohm's law, just the basics. Ohm's law is I current equals V voltage divided by Z impedance. So if I want to solve for not just any I, but I Z, right? <clears throat> then I need, what's my voltage across from here to here? It's going to be what? V Z E Q, right? Our new voltage drop that we just solved for. And then what about my impedance? Do I need Z E Q or just Z? Let's see. The current through, let's pick on any two points, right? The current through from here to here is going to be IZ equals the voltage across here to here. And that's VZEQ divided by the impedance from here to here. That's Ohm's law. It's just Z. Pick any two points. Look at the current. Look at the voltage across. Look at the impedance across. All right. <clears throat> What happens if we substitute in, did we just solve for the new voltage drop? We sure did, right? What happens when we substitute that into Ohm's law? In other words, here's my eraser. Here's VZEQ, right? We're going to take this whole thing and put it right on top of this fraction. So I've got this guy, and I'm going to do one big divide by see big ugly fraction right or i can do what i can take this z and i can put it where i can put it right here right haven't broken any rules have i i've just substituted in this whole expression for the new voltage drop i've just substituted in to our ohm's law over here solving for iz all right what uh, oh i'm sorry you can't see it how's this my head's in the way, says Johnny. How's that? You guys see now? So all I did, here's Ohm's law for IZ. IZ equals VZEQ over the individual conductor impedance. I just took this whole expression that we just solved for, VZEQ, and I substituted in right here, right? All right, what cancels now? How about uh, impedance cancels, right? So now I've got IZ, the current flowing through each individual conductor, right? Right here, the current flowing through each individual conductor, IZ, equals the, we can call it the load current I or the current supplied by the power supply I divided by what? Divided by N. So have we increased or decreased? Again, we are we're decreasing by a factor of n, right? Another neat way to do the same thing. Who here is familiar with Kirchhoff's current law? Let's say or KCL. Kirchhoff's current law says the current entering equals the current leaving, right? I've got one I entering, three I Zs leaving, don't I? So down here, Kirchhoff's current law. You guys see okay? Now I've got the I entering the load current or the supply current equals the first IZ plus the second IZ plus the third IZ. Can I simplify this? How about uh, I equals three times IZ? Here's our conductor current. When we write this, the conductor current IZ equals I over three, right? Over N. Same thing right here. All right, you guys ready to solve this now that we've taken the time to really understand this relationship? I'm going to zoom out a little bit. 
Let's see if we can see every, there we go. We can see just about everything on the screen. Okay, A says the voltage drop across each phase, not across each conductor, from the source to the load, this says will increase by a factor of n, right? It'll get multiplied by n. Or they're saying it's directly proportional. Is this true or false? False, right? Not true. A is false. Right here, look, the voltage drop, B, we're decreasing. B says the voltage drop across each phase, remember, not across each conductor. <clears throat> oh, actually, you know, it is the same, isn't it? The voltage drop across each conductor from here to here is the same as the voltage drop from the uh, source to the load. All right, the voltage drop across each phase now will decrease by a factor of n. Divide by n, right? Or they're saying it's inversely proportional. Is this true? Sure is, says rule. Is true. B is true. All right, C, the current flowing through each conductor, that's IZ, will increase by a factor of N, right? Or they're saying, is this directly proportional? Are we multiplying by N? True or false? False, says Johnny. Yes, he's false. How do we know? Here is IZ. Is IZ increasing by a factor of N or is it decreasing by a factor of N? It's decreasing by a factor of n, or it's being divided by a factor of n. It's inversely proportional. So that means D is true, right? All right, last one. E, the equivalent line impedance. What's that? That's ZQ. For each phase will decrease by a factor of n. Is that true or false? Is it decreasing by a factor of n? Are we dividing by n number of conductors? Is that an inversely proportional relationship? Sure is, right? True says Chandler, true says JP, Lola, Tiffany. Yeah, look right here. Z equivalent, the equivalent line impedance, we're decreasing by a factor of n. So E is also true. So final answer for this one is B, D and E are all true. Ta da. Any questions? All right, we got one more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep on rolling. A lot of good comments in the chat. Keep them coming. Uh, we're going to roll through this last one. I don't want to keep you guys any longer than I need to. It's funny. Uh, I nailed all three problems under an hour last week. Um, I figured this week we'd go faster through the introductory uh, since I knew most of you would be here already again. Uh, and uh, we're already 30 minutes over. Um, it's, uh, sometimes, uh, a lot of the questions too help with that. All right. You guys ready for the last one? Let's see. Jericho said this was a good problem. Yeah. Any, uh, any light bulb moments for that last voltage drop problem before we move forward? Any last, uh, any light bulb moments for that? Matthew said all that problems are killers. Yeah. And you know, full transparency, uh, when I make problems, I make problems for, for learning specific learning objectives. I think about all the questions I get asked for voltage drop. How can I write a killer problem that's going to uh, shine a flashlight on any of those blind spots? Chances are, you know, when you go to the PE exam, they're not going to be as difficult. My problems are intentional uh, to help you learn. So they're going to be a little bit more challenging. <clears throat> All right, guys, ready? 54. 54 says, in the three-phase single-line diagram shown below, the input power to generator number one is 40 megawatts on the left. And the input power to generator number two is 45 megawatts on the right. We've got a customer that, that draws 35 megawatts and a second customer, we don't know. Problem says the amount of real power delivered to customer two to the nearest megawatt is blank. Fill in your response, right? Of course, this is a what kind of problem? We can call it fill in the blank. We can call it fill in your response. A uh, really quick one to do. Uh, doesn't really require a whole lot of rounding anyways. <clears throat> um, we cover this combined class four induction synchronous machines in our live class uh, and in power flow, which is part of class six, power factor correction and power flow. Uh, the NCES reference handbook, 
the efficiency formula, the general efficiency formula that we're going to use to solve this problem. It appears on page 27 under energy management 2.2.5. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to solve for the power leaving generator number one, real power watts. We're going to solve for the real power leaving generator two in watts. Then we're going to use that along with the real power being drawn by customer number one to figure out the real power drawn by customer number two. So down here on the bottom, I've got generator one and generator two just stand alone. Make sure my head's not blocking. <clears throat> All right. How do we remember the formula for efficiency? Ada, efficiency. Here's my trick. Is efficiency, what's the biggest number efficiency can ever be for a motor, for a transformer, for a generator? What's the biggest value? And it only exists on paper. Yeah, biggest value is one for an ideal motor, ideal generator, ideal transformer, meaning no losses. In real life, we know that efficiency is going to be less than 100%. It's going to be a decimal, right? If efficiency is a decimal, you got it, Jericho. You know my trick. If efficiency is a decimal, does the bigger number go on top of the fraction or on the bottom of the fraction? Bigger numbers got to go in the bottom of the fraction. What's bigger, input power or output power? What's bigger? Input power, PN, you got it. So we've got PN on bottom, P out on top. Input power for generator, that's the mechanical power in electrical units of watts pushing on that prime mover that's spinning the rotor inside the rotating magnetic field of the stator, right? Not all of that power gets converted to electrical output. We lose some, right? We've got some losses. The amount of power that makes it through to the electrical utility, that's our output power. So P is bigger, it's got to go on the bottom. All right, how do we uh, rewrite this to solve for P out? And this formula, it is on page seven of the reference handbook. You don't have to memorize it. I just like that trick. Let's say P out is just what? Efficiency times input power. That's all it is. All right, what's P out for generator number one? The efficiency of generator number one is right here, right? We've got 0 0.89 times, what's our input power for generator number one? 40 megawatts. All right, what's P out for generator number one? Um, let's wake up my calculator here. There he is, really easy, 0.89 times 40. I'm not even gonna use 10 to the six. If I do times 40, then I know, I know this number right here on the calculator, 35.6, I know that's also megawatts. How's a calculator? Is a calculator big enough for you guys to see or should I make it bigger? Is calculator big enough on the screen? Can you see the numbers and the keys that I'm pressing? It's too small, make it bigger? How about, how's that? A little better. All right. <clears throat> so this is what? Here's P out generator number one. Let's solve for P out generator number two. What's the efficiency of generator number two? It's right here, 0 0.87. What's my input power for generator number two? 45 megawatts. So my output power flowing to the bus from generator number two, back to my calculator, we've got uh, 0 0.87 times 45. Again, I'm not even bothering with 45 times e to the six. I don't care because I know that this number on my calculator, 39.15, I know that's also in the unit of megawatts. All right, we've got P out for generator number one and number two. All we're going to do is we're going to take those values <clears throat> and we're just going to show them on the original single line diagram. Okay. So generator number one is delivering 35.6 megawatts to the utility bus, right? Generator number two is delivering 39.15 megawatts to the utility bus, right? <clears throat> Customer number one 
is drawing, here's 35 megawatts, right? Customer number one is drawing this value right here, 35 megawatts. Anything left over not drawn by customer number one is being drawn by customer two, right? Think of a big game of tug of war. Uh, we're assuming this is an isolated system, right? There's nothing else shown on this single line diagram. So I like to think of it like this. Our utility bus right here, let me see if I can draw a nice oval. Try one more time instead of a square. One more time. If it's if it's a square, we're going to leave it. Ah, okay, I got it. So here's an oval. And I like to think of the utility bus as one single one single node, right? Right. There we go. That's better. All right. So our utility bus. Think of this as this is just one electrical node. Right. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> that means power in to the utility bus has to equal power out of the utility bus, similar to Kirchhoff's current law, right? In other words, power in to this node has to equal power out of that node, right? This is our utility bus. How much power is flowing into that node, into that utility bus? We've got 35.6 megawatts from generator number one, right? Plus, we've got 39.15 megawatts from generator number two. <clears throat> How much power is flowing out of that utility bus? Well, from customer number one, we've got 35 megawatts. <clears throat> and we've got the power being drawn by customer number two. Can I solve for the power drawn by customer number two? Sure. All I'm going to do is I'm going to take the power flowing in minus the power flowing out. Any power not being consumed by the first customer has got to be consumed by the second customer. So in my calculator, I'm going to say, <clears throat> I'm going to scroll up. Here's 35.6. It's highlighted. I press enter, brings it back down. Plus, I can do second answer, or I like to see the numbers on the screen to make sure I'm not making a mistake. There's the uh, power supply by generator number two, minus 35. Power drawn by customer number one. Left over, we've got 39.75 megawatts. Careful. What number goes in the box? Fill in the blank, AIT, fill in the response. What number goes in the box? 39.75? 40. Good job, Pedro, Lola. Yeah, it says uh, to the what? To the nearest megawatt. So I've got 39.75 megawatts. That's 40. The answer is 40, 40 megawatts. Really easy problem. Again, if you're comfortable with this stuff, uh, you could do it all in one shot in your calculator, or even using the efficiencies, right? You can do it boom, 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 real quick, real quick. Now, be careful. What type of power quantity did we just add up like this? What type of power quantities did we just add up? Real power, right? Yeah, good job, Kong and Jericho. We just added, let me uh, scroll down. I'm going to zoom in so it's not as messy. We added real power, P, in the unit of watts. Perfectly okay to do that. You can also do this with reactive power in the unit of VARs. Perfectly okay to add or subtract. Again, depending on the flow, on the direction. Is it entering the bus or is it leaving the bus? 
we do that commonly in power factor correction um, to figure out how much reactive power a capacitor would supply. We would subtract that uh, from what we would normally supply from the bus, right? Same concept. It's also okay to do this with complex power in units of not just volt amps, but volt amps and the angle. What is it not okay to take this approach with? Not okay, be really careful. Easiest way to get a simple power flow problem wrong. You don't wanna guess? What's the only power quantity I haven't named so far? What can we not just add up together? Yeah, parent power, Pedro, beautiful. Pedro said bracket S or magnitude S. Is this complex power? No, right? This is a parent power in the units of just volt amps. You can't do that. You can't take this approach with just volt amps, right? Why not? What's the angle of real power in watts? All the way over here on the left. What's our angle of real power? It's the horizontal or imaginary component or the real component of complex power. It's got an angle of, yeah, zero. Good job, Chandler. So I can add all the complex numbers I want that have the same zero angle. Same thing, reactive power. Reactive power has an angle of what? It's the vertical component or the imaginary component, right? Of complex power. It's got an angle of 90 degrees, either plus or minus, right? Again, depending on if it's flowing into the bus or flowing out of the bus, is it being supplied, is it being consumed? So I, again, I can add up looking at one common node or one bus power. I can do power in equals power out for reactive power because reactive power has the same angle. Complex power. If I've got the complex power flowing in and out, even if the angles are different, I can still add them together, right? Because I'm adding the vector. Think about like vector addition or phasor addition when you stack the phasors head to tail in the graph. I can add complex. If I knew the complex power of generator number one, maybe it was lagging by 0.8, supplying reactive power. Generator number two, maybe it's lagging, you know, 0.83. Maybe customer number one is lagging power factor uh, 0.72. If I added those complex values together, then I would get the complex power of customer number two. However, why can we not take that approach? with just apparent power. Because if we do that, what are we ignoring? If we do that, we're ignoring the angles, right? We're, we're, you can't just add magnitudes without taking uh, into consideration their angles. Yeah, you need the ang uh, angle, says Pedro. Missing the angle, says Johnny. Exactly. You see why it's so important? Again, these types of powerful problem problems are really easy. Easiest way to get these points wrong is, uh, ignoring the angles. And then the uh, last thing before moving on, um, someone asked in the chat to address the rated power. Let's see, JP said, Zach, uh, can you please address the red herrings of 55 megawatt and, and 50 megawatt? Sure, great question. Not red herrings. Uh, JP, I'm looking for you in the chat. Did we use 55 megawatt, the rated power of generator number one, and uh, 50 megawatt, the rated power of uh, generator two? Oh, I'm sorry. We did not use those. You're correct. Um, we used, we had given input power. We had 40 megawatts was the given input power for generator number one. And uh, generator two, the input power was uh, 45 megawatts. So yes, you are correct. Absolutely red herrings. Absolutely red herrings. Uh, JP and anyone else that can help me and JP in the chat. What do those values represent? Generator number one, 55 megawatts. Generator number two, 50 megawatts. What are these? Says what? Nameplate says Kenneth. Rated says Alex. Max rating says Chandler. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is your nameplate rating. That's what it's, what's going to be stamped on the generator. Um, pretty much at, at rated conditions. You see that all the time in practice problems. Rated conditions or full load. That's your rated power output. Not your rated power input. Your rated power output. So the problem could have said, uh, generator number one, instead of instead of the input power to generator number one is 40 megawatts, problem could say generator number one is operating at 
rated conditions. And the input power to generator number two is still 45 megawatts. How would that change the problem? Instead of knowing 40 megawatts of the input power generator number one, instead, problem says, let's make pretend, problem says generator number one, operating at rated conditions. What would this number, the power flowing from generator one to the utility bus, what would that change to? Set of 35.6, we would have what? Yeah, we'd have 55 megawatts. We would have the full rated power of generator number one flowing to the utility bus. And in that case, then what would be the red herring for generator number one? We know generator number one is operating at rated conditions. Yeah, Kong, good job, Kong. Efficiency. In that case, do I need to know the efficiency of generator number one if I know it's operating at rated conditions and I know the rating of generator number one? Nope. In that case, I don't need the efficiency of generator number one because we already know it's rated for 55 megawatts. It's operating at rated conditions. So generator number one is supplying all of its 55 megawatts directly to the utility bus. Let's see, JP said, thank you, makes it clear. Good, good. Yeah, glad I could clear that up. Uh, another common question I get all the time, transformer ratings, motor ratings, generator ratings, are those input or output power quantities? Are those PN or PL? Output, good job, Johnny. Yeah, comes up all the time in life class. If I have a transformer rated for 115 kVA, I don't care about the input. I care about if I have 115 exactly kVA load and I'm okay to run that transformer at 100%, then I need my 115 kVA transformer. Your machine ratings are always paired to the output because that's what you care about when uh, on an application basis when you're sizing. You know, you're always going to size a little bigger, uh, but <clears throat> you care about what is it going to deliver. If I have a 50 horsepower rated motor, it's rated to deliver 50 horsepower to a mechanical load. If we convert that to watts using the uh, conversion factor, then that's still output, except in electrical units. We would have to use efficiency in that case to go back to PM. Good questions. Yeah, Pedro. Pedro said he only care when paying the utility. You got it. Absolutely right. Because we pay for the amount of power it's actually consumed, right? We pay for not just P out, right? We pay for P out and P loss. P out plus P loss is? Yeah. Ta -da. All right, man, 750. Doubled the time tonight that I thought that we're going to go. It's about eight o'clock. I think my wife's downstairs ready to, ready to eat dinner. Um, before we wrap, first of all, how'd you guys like the four AIT problems tonight? Um, we had about half the people, half people attend compared to last week. I think some people thought we we're going to cover the same problems. Uh, kind of worked out nice because it, it gave me more time to kind of interact and answer, uh, answer more questions in the chat, kind of interact a little bit more. Um, any big light bulb moments from those AIT problems? Any takeaways about AIT problems in general? Uh, what's your thoughts on AIT problems? Uh, any questions on our brand new book, which I'm going to show you right now how you can purchase uh, at cost during the book launch. <clears throat> Let's see, a lot of thank yous and greats in the chat. You are very welcome. Good. Just about everyone saying solid selection of problems, said Matthew. Hey, Matthew, guess what? I picked those problems at random. <laughs> uh, every single problem is, uh, is that effective of a teaching tool in that book. All 80 problems are really worth their weight in gold. It, it represents really uh, the best that we have to offer right now. Mina said, does the book include solutions? You betcha. So look, 80 problems. Uh, there's 312 pages in this book. Um, it's all solutions. This book is massive because it doesn't matter where you get stuck. The solution is going to walk you through it. And right here, I even have um, screenshots directly from the calculator showing you exactly how to type this stuff into your calculator. So it doesn't matter where you get stuck. Every single problem, it's going to painstakingly handhold hold you. It's going to help you uh, figure out where you got stuck. Um, who here has worked a practice problem in the official NCS practice exam or any other practice exam? And it's like two lines. You can't figure it out. You have no idea how they went from the first line to the second line. You spend hours and days sometimes trying to figure it out. 
and you finally figure it out. And there is about three or four assumptions that the author made that they didn't include in the solution because they figured you would know it. And they didn't explain what they're doing. And by the time you finally figure it out, it, it makes total sense and it's easy, but it was a massive waste of time, right? If they just stated, these are the assumptions, this is this, this is this, this is how we got here. It, it's a no brainer, it's easy, but you waste you know six hours just chasing your tail, chasing books, Googling, searching on YouTube, you can't figure it out. Um, I hate that. Uh, when I took the P exam in 2014, uh, it was just, I want to pull my hair out. It was just hard to learn. Uh, that's why this practice exam is 312 pages long. Uh, if you got a problem right, great. You don't need the solution. But I'm willing to bet, even if you get a problem right, you're still going to learn from every single solution in this book. Uh, it really represents um, just about every single question that I ever get asked. Um, it's just painstaking detail. Look, uh, I just, as a coincidence, I just flipped to 54, the problem we just solved, just by chance. So here's what the solution looks like for 54. Look, there's generator one. That's exactly where I got that graphic from. It even shows you exactly what to type in in your calculator. It takes you through every, every step of the way. All right, let's see. What else did I miss in the chat? Um, Chandler said drag and drop is a good problem to go through. Great. Nearest is going to haunt me, says Jericho. Just, it just takes some practice. Sindhu said, very good. I really like uh, these moments. Great way to learn. Fantastic. Pedro, yes. Pedro, that's what it's all about. Uh, Pedro said they're less scary when you dissect them. Yeah. Why did tonight go double the amount of time? Why did we go two hours instead of one? Um, each of these problems, if you're comfortable, you could knock these out two, three minutes if you know it, right? Learning it, we got to dissect them, right? We got to do it step by step. And if we do it step by step by step, one single change at a time, then we can learn it. It's easy to learn. And more importantly, it's easy to remember. Because instead of memorizing, what are we doing? We're just learning how to get there. We're learning the steps, right? Instead of trying to memorize formulas and stuff, all we got to do is uh, get comfortable with basic circuit analysis, KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, power formulas, and just change one thing at a time. All right, Arturo. Oh, Arturo said the book was delivered yesterday. Great. Great. JP said, I love that you do not assume I know something. Yeah. Uh, it just, it's not fair. You know, everyone has, uh, everyone comes from a different working experience background. Everyone comes from a different uh, college education. Some people are fresh graduates taking the PE exam in a decoupled state, first year to college, really sharp on math skills. Some people are about to retire and they want their license because it helps them get a better pension, right? Or it's just a milestone they want and they're really rusty on math. You gotta, you gotta take everything into consideration. And even just kind of going through this stuff, even if you're already familiar, by sharing my process with you, uh, a lot of people say when they take the P exam, um, they hear my voice, or a lot of people that take uh, our class, when they're taking the P exam, um, they say that they, they hear my voice when they're taking the exam in, in their ear because it's like they're going through using that same mythology um, uh, to approach the problems. Arnaldo said, uh, thank you for going above and beyond to help us out. Happy to. Um, Jericho said the book is starting to change color from white to gold. Thank you, Jericho. Uh, Alvin said your material is awesome and uh, your discussions are greatly explained. The book cost is really affordable. Thanks so much. Hey, you're welcome. Um, I, I know a lot of people don't have the budget for a class. Uh, some employers also won't pay for reimbursement. Uh, it's why our, our free trial, we've got more information in the free trial than some programs have in their paid version. Uh, our YouTube channel, we've got more content on the YouTube channel than some programs have in their paid paid content. Um, I, I get it. The P exam is already expensive. Not everyone has a budget for this. I'm sure there's plenty of people here uh, that are just in the free trial that they're not going to take the class anyways. And that's that's perfectly okay. Uh, part of the reason why, and we'll, we'll talk about this slide right here, part of the reason why I'm currently pricing it at literally the lowest price $20.14. It's the lowest price I can set on Amazon to sell this book. Um, I think we're probably, I'm probably going to do one more of these webinars next week. So during this whole three week kind of book launch party, I'm keeping it at the, at the lowest price. I literally earn $0 for every sale right now at $20.14. Literally, it's the cost of printing and the cost of shipping. That's it. Um, again, I understand that not everyone has the ability to, uh, has a budget for a class, 
This way we can get the hard copy. It's all high resolution images. Everything's super crisp. Uh, you know, anyone can, that needs this book can get their hands on it, right? Um, so if you're looking, if you haven't got the book yet, all you got to do, everyone knows amazon.com, right? <clears throat> Go to amazon.com, type in my name, Zach Stone PE. Uh, as we talked about last time, make sure you type PE. There's a, a, a 10 or 15 year old MTV show called Zach Stone. It's going to be famous, no relation. Um, but sometimes if you type in just Zach Stone, it'll pull up some of those DVDs. Uh, so type in Zach Stone PE, uh, or I think you can also type in um, electrical PE review. It, it might pop up. Um, but yeah, just look for the books. Uh, if you click on it, the here's our new one, right? Here's the, the older one that the tablet's sitting on. Uh, the new book, again, uh, you can get it within two days right now. It's on prime shipping. Uh, once we're done with this book launch after next week, uh, I'm about halfway done of updating this, the old one for the CBT format, um, just including footnotes, where to find the formulas in the reference handbook, updating all the formulas and variables to include uh, the versions that are used in the reference handbook. So for example, reference handbook says V1 and V2 instead of V primary, V secondary for transformers. Same thing, right? Uh, tomato, tomato, same thing. Um, but we're just updating this to make it uh, make it more of a match. And then I think what I'm going to do is once that's done and and republish on Amazon, we'll probably do a, a similar kind of book launch party. And I'll do a few weeks of solving some of these problems live. Um, that way, even if you can't purchase the book, you can you can work through them. It'll, it'll be a great benefit to you. We'll post it on our YouTube channel. And uh, same thing, I'll probably price this at the minimum too during that book launch just to, to help get it out, right? That way, uh, everyone can get uh, access to these training materials. Really, it's uh, especially the new ones, really the best best content out there for the P exam. I, I really mean that. <clears throat> I am biased. I didn't make it, uh, but there's a reason why we're the most popular program for the Power P exam. Um, we get mechanical engineers, civil engineers, electronics engineers all pass. Uh, power engineers, uh, people coming from different programs that can't pass, they, they all pass. Everyone does well. All right. Any questions? It is eight o'clock on the dot Eastern time. Uh, I'm happy to take a few and then uh, then I'm hungry. It's eight o'clock here on the East Coast. Uh, I think my wife is also uh, ready to eat. I'm sure you guys are ready to go to by now. Um, what else? Anything that I missed? Let's see, I'm looking in the class. Matthew said, been working the this AIT book all week. Feeling good going to the P exam next week. Hey, Matthew, good luck. Good luck. Um, really uh, rely on the fundamentals when you take the P exam. <clears throat> Alex said, best competitive price for Zach's material uh, than anything out there, including his course. Yeah. Uh, Tiffany said, so happy I signed up. Um, my testing nerves are slowly fading away. Great, Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany, I've seen you in our, our new student message board. Uh, really take advantage of that. It starts to slow down a little bit during the on-demand semester, uh, but it's still more active than any Facebook group, any Reddit, subreddit, any engineer boards. Um, it's the most active board uh, I'm on there all the time too, as you know, it just helps to kind of get a sense of, you know, you're not alone. You're not doing this by yourself. Chandler said, you said at the beginning that you're still updating the first book on the list. Yeah. Um, our first practice exam, the, it's uh, electrical engineering PE practice exam and technical study guide. Uh, if you haven't bought that, um, hold off, right? Uh, it's typically, I think, $39. Every now and then, Amazon will run a sale, probably when they have too much in inventory. Um, but if, you, if you're thinking about buying it, um, I'll be honest, hold off. Um, we're, I'm about halfway through uh, updating it to match the reference handbook. And just like the AIT book, I'm going to drop the price to at whatever minimum that Amazon will let me set it to. I'm going to drop the price. Uh, so it's your opportunity to get both of these books pretty much for the price of one. And uh, don't worry, we're going to be I'll be sending out announcements to uh, when that's available. Kong said, when is the new practice exam out again? Uh, who can help me answer Kong in the chat? When, where's my tablet? When is the new practice exam available for purchase? When is our new practice exam? You get it right now, go on Amazon. It's, it'll typically be shipped to your doorstep in two days with uh, Amazon Prime. All right. Any last minute questions? Alex said, when do you plan on uh, uh, updating the, the, so this practice exam to repeat, 
This one's a new one. It's out right now. These are the problems we just worked today. Uh, this is our first practice exam. It's a fantastic practice exam, still better than anything else out there. Uh, but I'm about 50% of the way updating this one. Um, it'll probably be uh, probably republished in uh, in a week or two. It, it won't be much longer. Mostly just doing some more proofreading. All right. Well, um, 8.03 p.m. here on the East Coast. Just want to say thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. Let's uh, change the camera view here. Get nice and big on the screen. Yeah. So thank you so much uh, for joining me tonight. Uh, I really hope um, you guys took value from this. Uh, whether you sign up for our class or not, not a big deal. Um, uh, people more or less kind of find their way to us anyways, but uh, more importantly, really just help, here to help. Um, I like being part of the community. You've probably seen me. I'm active on Reddit, Discord servers, YouTube, engineer boards, Facebook groups. Um, I really just, I try to make myself available. Uh, I enjoy helping uh, people with the exam. I, I enjoy sharing my knowledge. Uh, so I really hope uh, everyone attending tonight, I hope you uh, gain something from this that you're going to take with you. Um, if you want more help, uh, I hope you purchase that practice exam. Get it right now at cost. Um, it's it's going to be the cheapest it'll ever be. Um, if you're interested in signing up for an online course or an online class, uh, this is kind of a, a look into what we deliver live. Uh, kind of gives you an idea of the depth of our explanations, yeah, how interactive it is with the chat, right? It's not boring. You're not going to fall asleep. You're not sitting at, you know, watching slides. Uh, you know, no one likes that. So hopefully if you are looking for an online class, this does kind of give you a taste for that. Um, and uh, that's a wrap. So this video will be posted on our YouTube channel probably by tomorrow, depending on what my weekend looks like. And then, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to do one more of these live webinars. So just keep an eye on your inbox uh, for the Zoom registration link. We'll probably go out to Tuesday of next week for the last third webinar uh, for the uh, new AIT practice exam book launch. Uh, JP said Friday. Yeah, I'll probably do Friday same time just to make it uh, consistent. Johnny said, thanks. Have um, have a good Friday. Really enjoy your teaching method. Happy to hear that, Johnny. I'm, I'm glad uh, glad you enjoy it. I'm glad you're, you're getting getting out, getting some out of this. All right, everyone. Uh, we will see you hopefully next week. Thanks for joining.